So what does the future hold for molecular machines? I don't know. I can't really predict the future. Uh, if you want to predict the future, you basically create it, I guess. That's the way I look at it. So um, I'm not going to give you an answer for that. Uh, what I'm going to give you an answer is why am I personally working with molecular machines? I would say it's molecular switches more than machines, but uh, we'll get into that as well. Um, if you think about life, if you think about biology, everything is related about with motion. Something has to move. There's, there should be a gradient. There should be basically bones rotating or translating or moving around. And once this movement stops, you get to, let's call it a thermodynamic sink, and you die. So static basically is death. If you want anything which is adaptable, anything that changes, anything that will do anything interesting basically as a function of a stimulus, you need some type of a switch, you need some type of a machine to do it. And this is why I am in this field. Now, some would say that the field is mature. I would argue it is not. There are certain parts of the field which are mature, but there's a lot of things that still need to be addressed, and there's a lot of challenges. And I think once we address these challenges, then we might basically be able to um, get all the fruits that can be gotten. So these three characters over here, they got the Nobel Prize a few years ago. This was basically in the Grand Hotel. Um, I was lucky enough to take that picture over there. Um, and one of the things I usually do is basically quote Ben Ferencha when, when he got the news that he, he's getting this award. He basically said that he feels like the Wright brothers because he feels that they just basically just created flight to a certain extent. But there's a long, long, long way to get from what the Wright brothers did to a Boeing 747. Okay? Now, in my group, we try to address some of the things that are needed, let's say, to get to Boeing 747. And some of these we heard today and yesterday, actually. There's a lot of things that need to be addressed, I think. So how do we make switches talk together? How do you get signal amplification? How do we control catalysis? How do we control waste management? How do we have feedback loops? How do we have molecular clocks? Um, how do we have compartmentalization? How do we sequencing of things? Self-replication, collective coordinated motion, um, interfacing, scales, not only with base scales by from nano to macro, we're talking about time scales. The medium we talked about as well. Um, Non-equilibrium processes, uh, efficiency of the processes, so flow, um, and eventually complexity, and maybe eventually when we figure all of this out, we might be able to go and create some form of a life. Okay, so there's a long, 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 long way to be able to do any of the things that I personally want to do in a lab. Can yes, I sure, of course. For the sake of the people in the room, what's the likelihood that three people would turn up in one hotel with casual clothes and all be dressed in the same color? <laughs> well, on that night, it was 100% Fraser. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I think biology has been doing this for quite a while. Biology has a lot of energy, resources. There's basically time basically we need as well and tools. Um, I think in the field we're lacking tools and that's one of the things that we've been working on for the past, I would say, decades. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of the tools that we've developed um, to address some of these problems. It's not going to be all of it um, and I'm already behind schedule as usual. Um, I promise I'm going to let you go to the bar as quickly as possible. Um, so slide number three, Rob. That's whoever voted slide number three got the bet. Um, hydrozones, that's what we do. We basically want to develop simple switches that are easily made. Um, and you can basically hopefully do something complicated with it. So synthesis is easy. I'm not going to go to details here. I'm just going to give concepts. So the idea over here is that you have this molecule. It doesn't really matter what it is. You can protonate this nitrogen. It's an acid-base reaction. And you have a simple rotation around the CN double bond. That's all you're doing. Isomerization, Steve mentioned it earlier on. Once you get this, you can deprotonate this. Now this is a metastable state. And eventually, this goes back. So what you're doing is basically just a rotation, 180 degree rotation around the double bond. Okay. Now the question is, what can you do with this? You can do a lot of interesting stuff. Now this is a molecular switch because there's no directionality in this motion. You're not producing any work. You're not doing anything basically out of the ordinary. However, 
This was probably one of the first chemically activated easy isomerization out there in the literature. Now, what can you really do with this? This is something also Steve showed basically, is you can basically make this molecular robotic arm, where you can basically take a cargo and based on the acid and base chemistry I just showed you, basically move things from one station to another station. This is something that was developed by David Lee. And as I said, we develop tools. And of course, people have to use the tools. And you can see at the center of this tool is one of the hydrosome switches that we developed. And there's a lot of interesting stuff over here, but for the sake of time, I'm not really going to go into it. But again, this is how you take a switch and you develop a machine out of it, where you can basically push things out of equilibrium, do a lot of interesting reactions. And this nature chemistry shows basically you can control the stereochemistry of, of basically a product. Um, what we do, we do basically a lot of interesting other stuff with this. For example, feedback loops. This is basically one of the earliest, I would say, examples of a negative feedback loop, which is a completely synthetic system. The idea is relatively straightforward. You have one of our hydrosomes. You have the input, which is the zinc. This is the input that we want to control. There's a binding event, and there's this acid. We want molecules to communicate with other things, and the way we communicate is through this acid transfer. At a certain concentration, basically, of the zinc, there's enough of acid to do a deprotection over here. When this deprotection happens, you get this amine. In the same solution, basically, there is an aldehyde. This amine and aldehyde condense together. They form an imine. This imine binds to the zinc better than this hydrozone. And once you form the imine, it goes and sequesters the zinc, basically, from this hydrozone towards there. And once you do that, you lower the concentration of the acid. And once you lower the concentration of the acid, you basically stop the reaction. Okay, so this is a negative feedback loop. What we're doing is, I will explain this again. We have a zinc concentration. Once we go above a zinc concentration, it starts a cascade of reactions that forms a product that takes the excess of zinc and lowers it back to the original level we want. And the level is 20 mole percent. This is called a negative feedback loop. This is a relatively complicated series of events. And I would say this is one of the most complicated series of events based on a synthetic, basically, uh, switch, I would say. So this is very nice. Um, one of the things that you would have to think about when you're doing chemically activated switches is the waste product. Every time you're adding zinc and you're doing all these reactions, you're always creating extra waste. And something has to be done with this waste. Biology has a fix for this, basically. It gets rid of the waste. We still don't have a way to get rid of chemical waste. The flow systems might be one of it, but we're still not there, I would say. So here's our idea of how to get rid of chemical waste. We couple different switches together. We make switches talk together. Okay. Here is a light activated switch. You switch this on, it closes down and releases a proton. Now we have this hydrozone over here, it picks up the proton and gets switched by itself. So light releases a proton, protons does the protonation, and the switch switches. This is the NMR, we do a lot of characterization, and this is the NMR after we switch back the system. You can see we start from here, it doesn't matter, just follow this test, just go there, and you go back where you started from. Now what's interesting over here is basically this is the 100th cycle. You can do this more than 100th cycle. There's not an extra signal in that NMR spectrum because there's no waste being produced over here. Okay? So waste production, waste management is another thing that we have to be thinking about. So okay. um, if you're interested in these chemically activated switches, I recommend reading one of these reviews over here because I'm not going to go into more details. Chemistry. Chemical input is important. We're interested in chemical input because this is what biology does to control molecular switches and machines. Um, but also there's another aspect which is light activation. There's benefits for both of them, but I'm gonna show you that you can do a lot of interesting things with light as well. I don't know how much time I have, so who knows. So another hydrozone, all we did is remove the, basically a nitrogen from there. Um, we can switch this with light, backward and forward. I'm gonna skip all the details. There's a lot of information over here. The most important thing is that this is a bistable switch. Well, bistable switch, we mean basically, you go from here to there, this guy is happy, it will stay there about 2,700 years. That's the lifetime, basically the half-life of that switch. So usually photo switches or geometrically basically easy isomerizable photo switches like isobenzene, are not bistable. So there's benefits to bistability, and I'm gonna show you what they are. 
We can play around with these switches. We put the dimethyl amine. This is a collaboration with Alberto. We do the same switching process as well. And now this is basically emissive. This is not emissive. So we can control the emission of this switch using light. So we're controlling light properties using light. And there's a lot of interesting things you can do with this in conjunction with the geometrical change. For now, we're looking at basically how we can take this and deliver a drug where we want it. We can release the drug because we're switching the geometry, and we know when the drug is being released because we have a change in the intensity of the fluorescence, which is telling us where the drug is being released and how much of the drug is being released as well. Okay, and all you're doing, all of this is using one very simple, basically easy isomerization and controlling the emission. So, this is what you do in serum, but here is the fun part, I would say. I like using this. This is a toluene solution of the switch. It's under UV light. We're basically coming and switching the molecules. This is real life, what you're seeing over here. You're basically switching the molecules from their on state to their off state. And because these are bistable, the molecule is not quickly going back, so it's not getting erased. There's diffusion, of course, over here, but these lines are very, very thick, so it takes about an hour for the diffusion to take place. But once you're not doing anything, this toluene solution will stay there. Eventually, you're irradiating with Wheelot, you basically erase the information. This is a canvas. You're using solvent as a canvas, and you can draw whatever you want with this. And we think there's a lot of interesting applications that can come out of this. We can do this also basically in the solid state. We talk about basically how we should organize things in the solid state to make them switch. Here, we don't really need much organization. We can take these solids, we can basically put them on the wall, and we can start writing on the wall, okay? Um, and this is basically something that we were helped with Alberto and Massimo. And what's very, very interesting over here, even the emission switching will stay in the solid state. We can also do basically two photon excitation of this in the solid state. So think about this. We can take a small crystal. We can do 3D microscopy in this small crystal. We can write information in this very small crystal. And we can use the on-off, turn-off, basically, of the emission to do readout of information. If you can actually really go and do this, you can write all the information in the basic library of the Congress in a very, very tiny space. And there's a readout mechanism, and it depends on light. So it should be fast. We can play around with these. We can play and tune the information. That's not really important. Um, why is it important to make new switches? Because most new switches will bring new opportunities which are not possible with the current ones. Um, here's one example. This is basically, again, our switch with a chiral dopant. These are bistable, which means we can control the isomer ratio as a function of the irradiation time or the irradiation wavelength. We can fix each one of these isomer ratios in solution. We can take this dopant and put it in liquid crystals. When we dope it with the liquid crystals, we control the pitch of the liquid crystal. If we control the pitch of the liquid crystal, you can control the color being reflected from it. So basically, these dopants are controlling the color of the liquid crystal. Now we can stop here, we can stop there, we can stop here and here and there. Each one of these is gonna have a particular photophysical property associated with it. And we can lock these. So these are basically, if you wanna think about it, these are kinetically trapped, self-assembled structures. Each one of them has a different information in it. So this is the switching process of the liquid crystal. We are unfortunately or fortunately are reflecting near infrared light, which is basically heat if you want to think about it. We want it to be indivisible, but infrared is decent as well. So basically we're hiding infrared over here. Eventually at a particular wavelength, at a particular um, isomer ratio, there's basically 100% transmission. So there's basically ch something changing in this liquid crystal. I'm gonna avoid, this is what happens if you guys are interested, there's a phase change. You cannot see this phase change in azobenzene. Azobenzene is the benchmark, I would say. There's 700 publications a year about azobenzene, and I would say there's not a single application that came out of azobenzene so far. Real life application. Um, good luck doing anything like this with azobenzene. Um, here what we're showing is that these systems are not going from order to disorder, like azobenzene, we're going from order to higher order. And there's a lot, of, and it's bistable as well. So what does this mean? You're not gonna see this over here, but this is two slides. We have the material and basically liquid crystal commercially available, doped with five more weight percent of our compound. Basically this is um, opaque, I would say, because this is a cholesteric phase. 
we shine light on this, we open this window because we're going to basically smectic A, which is transparent, because that's what's happening over here, and we can close this back as well. We can do this hundreds of times, there's no degradation, there's no electronics over here. Think about this basically as a window that is blocking infrared light from coming in, and at a particular wavelength of light, it opens the light basically and lets the light through. So this is something you can do. Last but not least, we can also play with, now this is a machine, I would say, to a certain extent. We can play with these molecules and we can incorporate them in uh, polymers, in, in elastomeric polymers. And again, there's a lot of things. This is a collaboration with Nathalie or Katsonis. Again, when we switch these in liquid crystals, we go from order to higher order. There's no disorder, which means that the geometry change is responsible for the uh, changes we see in the polymer itself. Um, this is a chemistry engineering news that came out early last year in 2018, and I would say that researchers would like to create materials that can be deformed in stages passing through multiple shapes. Most of the photoactuators out there based on polymers are based on azobenzene. You cannot lock the structure of azobenzene. People have been trying to do this for decades, okay? So, this is our basically photoactuator over here. A lot of design. You shine light on this, it starts opening up opening up, opening up, eventually it goes here, and we close this now. Okay, somebody can say, azobenzene can do this as well, yes, but you cannot stop here with azobenzene, you cannot stop there, nor there, nor there, nor there. We can stop at each one of these different stages, and the molecules and the system will be stuck there for years, because these systems are base stable, and nothing is gonna make them go back unless you hit this up very, very high temperatures. So, I would say that problem has been solved as well. So. That's it.